So where is the intersection of broadcast journalism and ordained ministry? Well, today on A Few Minutes With, my guest Bob Grip and I are going to identify one possibility as being Thomas Merton. And Bob and I have known each other for many years, actually in my previous vocation, previous career, I was a congressional press secretary. And Bob was the anchor for the Fox affiliate in Mobile, Alabama, where the congressman for whom I worked lived and was based. And so we got to know each other through that. But it was years later in 2011 when I went on my first retreat to the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky and Bob found out about it that we discovered we have a very strong mutual interest in the life and work of Thomas Merton. And being that Merton was a monastic, but even beyond that, he lived a very hermetic monastic life. Uh, and in this time of social distancing, uh, physical distancing, actually, I think is a better word because socially we're able to stay connected. I thought Merton would be a great topic to cover. So, Bob, thank you so much for doing this. It's great to see you. Yeah, I'm glad to be with you. Uh, anytime I can talk about Merton, just let me let me loose. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask you, and I'm surprised I haven't asked you this in previous years, but how did you first get introduced to Merton and, and to the the brothers at Gethsemane and the uh, International Merton Society? Accidentally is really the, the most precise reason. I wound up <clears throat> being introduced to him uh, at Boston College my senior year because I was a double major in communications and secondary education. I intended to be a high school teacher, but that didn't work out. But um, I had finally a chance to take some elective courses. And I thought, hmm. Here's a course on Zen Buddhism. I know nothing about that. I'm going to take this course. One of the required texts was called Zen and the Birds of Appetite by Thomas Merton and D.T. Suzuki. And so I read this book in class, and unlike all the other textbooks I had, I thought, I feel like this guy is writing just to me. Mm. It was a very personal form of communication. And so I read it graduated, kept the book around for 10 years, didn't open it again. Then one day I opened it up and I was like, oh, this is why I didn't throw this book away, sell it, whatever. And about the same time, PBS showed a documentary on Merton's life by a fellow named Paul Wilkes. And it was like one thing after another, after another. And then there was a traveling bookstore that came to our parish in Virginia Beach, and they had a biography of Merton by Monica Furlong. And I was like, at that point, I knew I was hooked. Um, at that point, I was transitioning work from Virginia Beach back down to Mobile for my second round. And on a lark, I decided to call up Paul Wilkes, who didn't know me from Adam's house cat. <laughs> and, and I called him up and said, hey, you know, I'm going to be driving to Mobile through Kentucky, is there, you know, any way that I can meet with any of, of the, the monks at Gethsemane? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, ask for Brother Patrick Hart, mm -hmm. who was Merton's secretary right in the years before he died, and just tell him I said, I said hello. I thought, all right, this is easy. So I made a stop, and Brother Patrick met with me. He didn't know me. But because I use that entree, hmm. it started a, a relationship, a friendship that, uh, that continued all the way through Brother Patrick's death. And once I got a taste of what Gethsemane had to offer, I, I was really, really hooked and then read just about everything that Merton wrote. Hmm. Yeah, and in fact, you've gotten to know over the years, I know you and Brother Paul have gotten to be very good friends as well. And uh, if I remember correctly, he was one of Merton's novices in 58, 59. Is that right? Somewhere it's, right it's, there? A, it's a long time ago, but you're <clears throat> right. He is one of the, the few monks left who actually have a direct contact with Merton, who, who can sort of draw lineage that way. Um, James Connor, Father Jim Connor, was also a student of Merton's. That's another one. But Brother Paul loves to bring groups up to Merton's 
hermitage where he lived the last three years of his life um, on the monastery grounds, but sort of tucked away where you really couldn't find it unless you were looking for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one I got to be, and I love the the collection and the gathering of of brothers there. Uh, the first year I went, I met Father Damien, who was the abbot mm -hmm. at one point at Gethsemane, and to be talking to him and have him talk about, you know, we talked about vocation and call, come to find out he'd been a, a cabbie in Chicago at one point. And so to, it's, it's incredible to look and see the calling that people have, you know, I have my own calling in the Episcopal tradition, but to talk to these brothers and find out where they felt their call originally and what brought them to Gethsemane. And so it's, it's a, a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity to get to know more about it and indirectly through them. And in the case with you and brother Paul and, and others getting to know Merton almost directly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Merton was not born Catholic, nor was he born in America. If you listen to video clips or audio clips, and we'll have a few of those through this program, you would think he was born and raised here in the States, but he was born in France and actually raised in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. and marginally, became, yes. Mar what do you mean marginally? Not, not an active worshiper? No, not at all. At one point <laughs> later in his life, Merton said, I believe in nothing. He went to church because his father was a church organist. So he kind of went there, but nothing really connected to him. And he just went through life believing in basically, like he said, nothing. May have that, that may have related to the early death of his mother mm -hmm. and where he was kind of cast adrift. And sometimes he was with his father, sometimes he wasn't. His father was a painter. He'd go off and do landscapes and and leave Merton with, with relatives. So there was that disconnect there. There wasn't that, that tight family unit that a lot of people are used to. So th that's a really interesting story of, uh, of conversion and redemption too. And I think he was ultimately confirmed. He was reading a book, if I remember correctly, it was a, a book on spiritual, medieval spiritual philosophy, mm -hmm. the kind of first grabbed his attention and so he was confirmed 22 i think and entered the entered uh, gethsemane at 24. i mean he was very 1942 was very young when he entered with with your experience with the brothers there what is what is the novice the novitiate like for uh young men that are coming to explore that sense of call you know, it's interesting. Some are, are young men, some are older men. Um, I talked to one of the brothers and said that they have more applications than um, places open. Really? They, they go through uh, careful screening because not everybody is, is, may think, oh, this sounds great. But when you do it day after day after day after day, you know, some people realize it's not quite the fit. And I think the monks realize that too. And they look for, for signs of, you know, is this a true vocation or is this just sort of a passing fad? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the uh, community has certainly shrunken a bit, but it's still, you know, viable and relatively lively. And once, so... A lot of people know Merton. You mentioned the Hermitage earlier, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, a lot of people that know Merton, even in passing, the Hermitage is a huge part of his life. But it's often surprising for people to find out that it was 23, 24 years before he ever progressed to the point in his work and, and life at Gethsemane to even get to that point. And I know some of that, I think, related. and. I don't know whether this can be shared or should be shared. I think he wrote openly about it. Some of the tension that existed between him and some of the abbots at Gethsemane, as far as this pull he was feeling. A lot of the abbots, actually. <laughs> there, was, there was this this constant tension where I think Merton wanted to break out and be more independent in a way, but he realized he needed to be reined in by his abbot. So there was this constant sort of tug of war. And I think the abbots 
through grace or sheer intelligence or something, realized this and figured, you know, he, he is a wonderful spiritual person, but he doesn't fit into a peg. You know, he, he is his own person and, you know, everybody is, is his or her own person. But Merton was pretty unique. And I think they, that was a creative tension in a way. And I think Merton had to sort of prove to his superiors that, yes, you know, he would be stable in this kind of situation away from the, the regular community. He still had contact about once a week. He came down to, for, for uh, mass and then um, he would give lectures, for example. And then he'd take his provisions for the week and then march back up the hill to, uh, to the hermitage. Hmm. Well, I'd like to play now an audio clip of Merton. This is taken from a series of lectures that he gave to the novices uh, at Gethsemane. One of the great things about it is if you go, and I do encourage people to go, both men and women are able to go and take retreat there. But one of the wonderful things that I always enjoy when I go is the fact that when you go to the dining room where talking is not permitted, during the meals, they play these recordings of Merton talking to the novices, and it's such a wide range of things. He could be talking about Buddhist spirituality in one, and you go away and you come back at dinner, and he's chanting psalms and talking about psalm chanting, and it's a, a wonderful range. And Merton Talks is actually a new series uh, that's been put out where people can subscribe for a very, very small fee every month and receive recordings of these. And it's just such an incredible gift to be able to hear this. So this clip that I'm going to play right now comes from one of those, and he's talking about retreat. And I'll use that as the springboard into talking about his life at the Hermitage. Why do we have to make retreats? Well, the idea of making a retreat is that the reason it's necessary, because normally we are forgetful of ourselves and forgetful of the big things that are important. And we get away from them, and we get lost, and we lose our grip on, on things, and we don't uh, keep in touch, and that sort of thing. And so the fruit of a retreat should be to get us back uh, remembering the big things. So in that clip, we hear Merton talking about the most important thing about making a retreat. And in essence, I think what he did with the last three years of life, his life, particularly when he was living at the Hermitage, was almost taking a retreat within a retreat to distance himself even more. Um, what can you tell me, Bob, from what you've learned and read and, and your interaction with the brothers at Gethsemane, what it was within him? You know, you mentioned earlier that the, the abbots were frustrated because he didn't fit into a specific peg or a specific spot. What was it about him that you've learned that pulled him to even distance himself further? I think it's a matter of, and we do this today, we, f we don't feel we're productive unless we're doing. Mm -hmm. You have to be busy. I think um, one group calls it monkey mind. And it's like, okay, I'm sitting here meditating, but you know, what am I going to have for lunch? And do I need to buy some stamps? And your mind just wanders everywhere and you never get a chance to just be, to just exist in that moment. And I think that's what Merton did up in the Hermitage. He'd go for walks in the woods, reading books. He'd listen to the birds. He'd feel the wind, all these things that people say, oh yeah, I could do that. But it, you know, it's, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And the idea of taking time out for prayer, for contemplation, for listening to God. You know, very often I find myself talking to God when I want something or when I need something, but not to express thanks or gratitude. And that's a hard habit to break because especially in the business world, it's very transactional. Mm -hmm. You know, I do this for you, you do this for me. And God's working sort of behind the scenes, and we don't see. And sometimes when he does act, we don't recognize it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that Merton tried to, to get, in a way, when he went up to the Hermitage. He was incredibly prolific. When you look at his output of letters and books and essays, especially when he was up in the Hermitage, I don't know how he did that unless through, through the grace of God, he was able to compose wonderful things 
And I think the silence played a big part in that. Mm -hmm. But he also seemed to have, you talk about his prolific writing, and one of the great gifts, I think, is that we have access to a lot, and I'm not sure it's all, but a lot of his journals that he kept, and he's very open and very frank about a lot of things, but there's almost this, this tension between the pull he felt to the life as a hermit, essentially, mm -hmm. and the inherent danger. And I'd like to, I want to read uh, a quote to start, and it comes from this great book, um, it's volume five of his journals that are published, uh, and I encourage everybody to get them. You can find them on Kindle and, and mm -hmm. Amazon and paperback and everything else, but this is a, a an entry from February of 65, so this would have been right around the time he started living full-time at the Hermitage, <clears throat> and he writes, it's such a delight. I can imagine no other joy on earth than to have such a place and to be at peace in, to live in silence, to think and write, to listen to the wind and to all the voices of the wood, to live in the shadow of the big cedar cross, to prepare for my death and my exodus to the heavenly country, to love my brothers and all people, and to pray for the whole world and for peace and sense among men. But knowing how deep and how thoughtful and how prolific he was in his writing, I don't think this really captures it. I mean, I think, um, you know, what, what did the hermitage mean to him? This, I almost think what he's written here is an understatement. It's like, this is how I feel, but there's something deeper. And you, you kind of touched on it a bit with, with the pull of God, but what, what did the hermitage mean? And that may not be a question you can answer, but Maybe you can. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, it meant, it was, I think his long-term goal was to live as a hermit. And keep in mind, in the Cistercian order, that's not normally part of life. In, in the Cistercians, they, their, their motto is, is prayer and work, and not necessarily work as being a writer. I mean, like working out in the fields and, and doing things like that. So he sort of broke the mold when his abbot was bright enough, his initial abbot, to real, really realize that he had a gift here as a writer to allow him to do that. And then another abbot saw a spark in him that said, yes, you know, we know that our, our uh, practice is to live in community, but I think it's important for him and for everyone that he has this chance to live out in the hermitage where he feels more in touch with God. And I think that's what he found out there. And it again goes back to that sense of being, mm -hmm. just living in that moment, realizing I can't do anything about my past. There's no point worrying about my future because that may not arrive, but I can control what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. You know, being good to people or corresponding with people. And, you know, he had a lot of correspondence. And for some reason, he, found uh, there was a, a young woman who wrote, little girl actually, and he started a correspondence with her. And you think about all the people in the world that he could have been corresponding with. He chose, he saw something in her gift that he wanted to sort of explore and maybe bring out of her. And it just, it's really interesting to see the people he associated with, most of them just by correspondence. A few of them made their way up to, to uh, the hermitage. And I've been told by a few of the people who uh, did manage to get up there that uh, a six pack of beer helped a lot <laughs> as a price of admission. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he talks in his story, as a side note, I'm sorry to interrupt, but he talks at one point about one of the brothers uh, bringing the new refrigerator and how it kept him up at night whenever it turned on to cool things off, but then he ultimately recognized the value of it. If it sounds like these six packs were waiting for folks, that was one of the inherent values of having this refrigerator at the Hermitage. <laughs> That's true. And, you know, it's not, the Hermitage isn't a museum. It is a place that is still used mainly by the, the monks to conduct retreats. But if you look at pictures from when Merton was there and the way it looks today, it's almost identical in terms of the books and the bookcase, the, the uh, fireplace, 
the little chapel that Merton celebrated mass in and the icons that he saw when celebrating mass, mm -hmm. the little uh, bedroom around the corner, the little kitchen. Um, the one thing that changed after they built the original hermitage was the addition of a bathroom because he used to have an outhouse. Mm -hmm. And he said that really wasn't conducive to Kentucky winters in the middle of the night. <laughs> so they relented and built something attached. But it's, it's still a place that's full of his spirit. And I think that's one of the joys of, of being there because when you go on a retreat at Gethsemane, and especially if you have that chance to go up to the hermitage, it, it can be a life-changing experience. And I know the, the brothers there, uh, you know, when it's not being used for uh, meetings and conferences, I guess conversely, it's still used primarily by the brothers for their own personal retreats, and then the conferences are scheduled around that time. But an interesting thing about it, you know, in talking about Merton and the Hermitage, Gethsemane actually has several hermitages on the property. You can be walking, uh, there's one, I can't remember, it's walking towards the, um, the um, memorial statues to Jonathan Myrick Daniel, and there's this beautiful small stone building sitting next to the path. It's got a prayer desk and some chairs inside, but I guess in a way it's it's also a hermitage, and even the one Merton lived in, his original one was much more of a shack, I guess, than the nice elaborate cinder block building that's there now. That's right. He used to go there in the afternoons and take some time to read or write, and it was really just a shack, you're right. Um, and it's ironic that after the, the fight to get that hermitage, which was resisted at first, the monk who retired after all of this, who was the abbot, moved into his own hermitage. <laughs> what is, so what there's is, always this power of, of change and redemption that, that keeps things going. What did, what did some of the other brothers feel about this? Because I'm, I'm sure there had to be this sense that preferential treatment or, you know, uh, preferred status as being bestowed on Merton and giving him this opportunity to have his own hermitage away from the rest of us. Did it, did it have any ripple effect or repercussions within the broader community or was it supported or was it a mixture of the, of the two? You know, most of the other monks spent their time, you know, praying and working. They didn't write like Merton did. So there might be a few who can, can address that, but I don't know of many who, uh, who expressed that kind of thing, or at least I haven't been looking for that kind of information. Mm -hmm. you no, know, maybe there was also another author who was there before Merton was. And I have read that, that he felt he had some sort of hard feelings, or his feelings were hurt, that all of a sudden, while he'd been writing for years and years, Merton comes in and he's a bestseller. And maybe that had an impact, maybe it's just being human. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I mean, even, even the Cistercian brothers at, at Gethsemane are human. I mean, they, nobody, nobody's above anybody else. They have to pray and ask for redemption and forgiveness of sin in the exact same way any of the rest of us do. Right. Merton would talk occasionally about um, having to sort of like, he had a problem with patience where he'd be in choir and the monk behind him couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. He felt, oh, I couldn't stand this. But it was one of these things. You have to live in community. You have to cooperate. You have to get along with everybody. And you're in community, but also you're sort of by yourself with God as well. Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't say camaraderie. I suppose there's a spirit. But everybody's on his own path. And... Yes, you're living together to support each other, but very much everybody's heading in a different direction, all aimed at the same goal. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned earlier in reading Merton's journals, uh, he seemed to be almost of two minds at different points about living this life of solitude. I read an excerpt from February 24th of 65 where he's talking about how wonderful it is. And just two days later, in the exact same journal, he writes this. I see more and more that solitude is not something to play with. It is deadly serious. 
It's not enough to like solitude or love it even. There is great beauty and peace in this life of silence and emptiness, but to fool around with it brings awful desolation. Hmm. That's a very uh, powerful you know, statement. And I could see where he's saying like, this is, you're right. This is something to just play around with. If you get into this, they're going to be ups and downs. And I think he felt that tension. If you continue to read through his journals, uh, you see that where one day he feels one way, one day he feels in another way. And the, the interesting thing about the journals is he had one thing sort of for public knowledge and then these private journals that you're talking about were meant as reflections for himself. Mm-hmm. And part of his, his literary uh, will was that these would be released 20, only 25 years after his death. Because like most Trappists, they live to a good old ripe age. You know, they're 90, they're, they're more than that. And so he thought, well, by the time I die, you know, everybody else will be dead. Well, it turns out he died very early in 1968. And so all of the journals started coming out and there were still people alive who he was talking and maybe not in the best way about. <laughs> so there was that tension there where people were finding out what Merton really thought of him. But I think the editors were, did a wonderful job of uh, figuring out you know, what to include, what not to include, but it's all out there now. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what you think, you know, we're in this point of uh, physical distancing and there are some people that are introverts that would normally choose to be solitude and away from themselves. But then there are a lot of people now that solitude has been forced on them, especially those that don't have family or friends living with them or, or nearby. So if they were to read this from Merton and to see one moment solitude is this wonderful gift and another moment solitude is this almost pitfall to be avoided depending on your approach to it. If someone were to ask you where they should find the inspiration or the hope in, in these two sides of the same coin, what, what would you offer to them or what would you share with them? I would say it's evidence that Merton has a common experience that you will identify with him because probably you feel the same way. And Merton had a a wonderful talent of not saying, oh, everything's wonderful and you become a Christian, everything is smooth, it's a clean path to heaven. And it's like, no, he once was quoted as saying that um, he didn't want to grow up or didn't want to be looked upon as a role model for children in Catholic schools. And I think that's sort of a wonderful statement that you just can't look up to him as a perfect person. No, he struggled like everybody else did. Mm -hmm. Just because he lived in a monastery didn't mean he he ran away. Maybe initially he thought, I'm going to leave the world behind. Well, guess what? The world had a way of coming in with him. Mm -hmm. He had to deal with that. And we have to deal with that too. Some moments are going to be great, some aren't, but there's consolation in contemplation and in prayer and in in trying to maintain sort of the joy of life and living in the moment. And I think that's what Merton did. He was very, very honest. And if everybody thinks that solitude is the way to go, all my problems will be over, guess what? Like he said, it's a dangerous thing to play with. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to shift gears to the the latter phase of Merton's life and there is a video clip uh, that I'm going to play now uh, very briefly and then on the other side of it we'll talk about the last phase of, of Merton's life. From now on everybody stands on his own feet but it is a statement to the effect that we can no longer rely on being supported by structures which may be destroyed at any moment by a political power, a political force. You cannot rely on structure. So with that clip, I think we find a much more outspoken and perhaps political Merton uh, than we've encountered through his his time at the Hermitage. And he did travel around the world and and did do speaking. Um, And I think it's important to draw the distinction in this day and age where things are so polarized, you often hear people talk about the fact that, oh, I think so-and-so is being too political. And I personally think it's a confusion between political and partisan. 
you may think they're being too partisan, but I mean, for goodness sake, look at the New Testament and, and the life of Christ. And Jesus was perhaps the most political, outspoken person that ever lived. And so, uh, you know, it's it's probably not necessarily surprising that there was a political, not a partisan, but political side to Merton. Um, could you give us a little context on that clip? Because it's not one that I had remembered seeing recently, and I think it, it factors in a very important part of his life in more ways than one. That's true. It was the one and only lecture of Merton's that was filmed and recorded. As you mentioned earlier, there were recordings of him giving classes that were later played for other novices because they had so many at the time. But this one, ironically, was captured by a Swedish film crew. And Merton, part of his uh, agreement with the abbot was there would be no publicity because this was uh, the first time in more than 20 years he was out of the country and he he went to what what is now called Sri Lanka what was then called Ceylon and then he was making his way around the east and so he's speaking in Bangkok and that ironically was the last public speaking of his life he died just a, a few hours later and his talk about, um, he was quoting the Dalai Lama as saying, well, from now on, brothers, everybody stands on his own feet. Mm -hmm. And what happens to structures if they disappear, if they get broken apart? And I worry about that now in terms of our quarantine and coronavirus. You know, are people relying on structures? Are they relying on church? but they can't go physically to church. So is church us? Is it in us or is it in the building? And it raises all sorts of questions. I wonder after sort of a hiatus from going to services on Sunday or Saturday, will people come back? And I know that must concern you, um, but I, I worry about that kind of thing too. It's like, what do we do if all the structures sort of get banished? And we're sort of getting a taste of that right now. I think it'll, it'll certainly be a reshaping. Uh, one of the things that a lot of clergy colleagues and even some of the bishops uh, have said in various forms is, A, when we do live streaming of worship that many, many churches are doing now, including my own, we're getting more people watching than we do in the pews on Sunday. So we're actually reaching more people. And then the challenge becomes, how do we get people back into the physical space and not lose the connection that we've built with all these others? But two, this is a point where not even just the church, but so many organizations and institutions are, as one of our bishops said, building the airplane while we're still flying it. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the structures are being reshaped. And again, it's not, you know, so many of the things in Merton's life were, uh, calls to vocation and things that he discerned and prayer about, but things that in some respects he chose. He chose to ask and to move into a hermetic life. He chose to write. He chose to, you know, whom he would respond. You talk about the little girl that he had the correspondence with. He chose who he would interact with. So much of the world today is very almost anti-Merton in that regard that none of us are really choosing any of what's going on around us. But I think, in a way, Christianity can be, um, it is very challenging. And just because the world is going one way doesn't mean that we have to follow along, mm -hmm. that we have certain precepts and, and guidelines that have been valid for centuries and centuries, and there's value to that. And I think Maybe the good, if there is something good coming out of this pandemic, is we're realizing that we can't always get our own way. Mm -hmm. That there's some, there's a power way beyond us that we need to acknowledge and be grateful for, as odd as that sounds in these days of a pandemic. But we don't control everything. And I think we've become very self centered as a society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe this is helping us get out and help our neighbors or say hello to somebody on the street that maybe, you know, if you're out walking and if you're in New York City, for example, and you say hello to a stranger walking the other way, they'll, they may curse you. They may go, well, what's wrong with you? Where, you know, here in the South, 
well, it's a different story. You, you can nod and smile and say hello to folks. Mm -hmm. Maybe that kind of spirit of cooperation will now move into other areas that haven't experienced that before. And that's the thing. There are so many gifts, you know, here in the northern Shenandoah where I live, there are so many things that people are doing, Facebook groups that just created almost on the spot of, okay, we need a place where we can collect so-and-so is in need, this family needs work done on their house, this, and just pulling these resources together. But, you know, parishioners dropping off at random points. Here I was in the neighborhood, here's a dozen eggs and some homemade apple butter. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping these gifts that are growing out of this are things that are not quickly put back on the shelf once all of this ends. I hope they're things that, that continue. Yeah, I saw that a little bit after 9-11. And it continued for a while, and then sort of things got back to normal. And I think, as everybody talks about, there's going to be a new normal. I wonder what things are going to be like in that new normal. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love doing in this series at some point in every conversation I'm having is asking kind of a hypothetical that may be impossible to, to answer. And so I'm going to ask you one now. If Merton were to walk in to the world today, in this particular point of, of distancing and pandemic with everything you know and i know prayer would be at the core because that's at the core of who he was and and his relationship with with god and that connection through prayer but in looking around the world now and the anxiety and the frustration and the the anger and the fear what do you think would he would say in an elevator speech if he was in an elevator say, safely distant six feet apart from someone but what he would say what he would say to someone in an elevator about the world now um i think he would reflect on the need for prayer i wonder when we're talking about hypotheticals what if electronic media were around in the day of merton would he have written 6,000 books by this point? Would he have communicated with tens of thousands of people because he could? Or would he still sort of take the time, and that's the beauty of a physical letter, is that you get a chance to read it, digest it, think about it, and actually physically write something. So by the time it gets on paper, you've really given it a lot of thought, where email is just like da -da 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 -da, back and forth, and there's the, the level of, of depth there is tiny. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe he would see this as a, a moment of outreach, as a way of, of showing how the world maybe should be and using the gifts that he's been given to share them with other people. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping anyway. Yeah. Thank you for that. And again, it's a, it's a hypothetical, uh, you know, depending on whether it's the Merton of February 24, 65, where <laughs> things are a gift, or February 26, where it's miserable and painful and dangerous. It's uh, just like our lives. <laughs> that's right. Well, let me, let me give you a minute here before we, before we end to uh, talk a bit about the International Thomas Merton Society and what their mission is and ways that people can get involved. Thank you. The, um, yeah, it's the International Thomas Merton mm -hmm. Society and uh, you can reach it at merton.org, merton.org. And it's centered at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky, because Merton, in the, the short time before his death, decided to sort of send all of his correspondence there to be, I think, to be safe, one, because he didn't know if maybe future abbots would say, oh, that Merton guy was way off base, you know, we'll just burn all this stuff yeah you want to make sure that didn't happen <laughs> so a lot of it wound up there some of it wound up at at saint bonaventure some of it wound up in at uh, columbia university because he was a student there but i think primarily most of it is at bellarmine and that's where the itms is centered um i was lucky enough to be president of the organization for a two-year term that's the limit you're, you're allowed two years and then off you go um but it's, it's to foster education. It's to introduce young people to the idea of Merton and what he has to say. And we have what are called Daggy Scholars. Bob Daggy used to be the curator of the Thomas Merton Studies Center, as it was called. 
and after he died, this group was was founded to um, help young people get introduced to Merton. We, we bring them to our conferences that we have one every other year. Next year, it'll be at St. Mary's in South Bend, right across from Notre Dame. But we've gone all over North America in terms of, of meetings, we have workshops, we have people presenting papers, and it's a chance to be with like-minded people. Sometimes I feel like I'm the only one who reads Merton in, in South Alabama. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not. But when you get together in conferences like that, and we have hundreds and hundreds of people who come from all over the world, you get a chance to renew what got you started on Merton in the first place and to share and to listen to other ideas. And it's a very rich experience. So I would encourage people to join. It's very reasonably priced. We uh, distribute a Merton annual, which is a nice thick book. I don't have it right here, but it's a wonderful way to keep in contact, to build that sense of community with other people who have found real value to the work of Thomas Merton. That's great. And I think too, if, uh, and I love the website, if people want to learn more about the Abbey of Gethsemane and when this time of distancing has ended, make arrangements to go for, for retreats, either solo or, or as groups, I think their website is still monks.org. It is monks. <laughs> it is monks. Somebody was very bright enough to capture that website before everybody else got to it. But yes, right now, of course, they're closed to outside visitors because of coronavirus. But as you mentioned earlier, they do have retreats. They used to be exclusively for men. And then things changed. And now it's be one week, just men, one week, just women. It kind of rotates like that throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get an entree into the, the abbey itself directly. You don't have to go outside. You can go from one floor right right into the, the choir loft, for example, or you can be down on the, the ground floor and they will feed you. Um, but most of all, they'll give you a chance to just read or walk through the woods. Um, and if you want to meet with a, a, a priest or a monk, that can be arranged too. Sometimes you just need somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's a great place to go for a retreat. So monks.org for the Abbey of Gethsemane Merton.org for the Thomas Merton uh, Center at uh, Bellarmine and also the ITMS. Great. Well, Bob, it was great catching up with you. This was such a great conversation. And if you ever find yourself in the, the northern Shenandoah, I could probably line up a lot of speaking engagements because this, this is an area where people really dive in. I've heard from parishioners that are using this time to actually read much more deep works and in a much deeper way than they have previously. So if you ever find your way up to the Northern Shenandoah, let me know and we'll, we'll set up a mini speaking tour for you. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. Take care. God bless you. Thank you.